Actually, I've been a member of SIS just under 30 years, and it, it, it is getting on for 30 years that I've been studying ancient chronology. Uh, and as I'm, I'll be 70 next year, I thought it was about time I started writing up my ideas in a somewhat systematic way. And uh, so I've done two articles in the last two reviews uh, on my ideas about the Exodus being at the end of the Old Kingdom in Egypt, much earlier than most people would go for and Joshua's conquest being at the end of the Early Bronze Three in Canaan. Um, now, the, the chronology I'm going to talk about only goes as far as the Amarna period, um, Orthodox uh, 1350 BC, uh, rather later if you follow one of the shortened chronologies. Uh, so, hence the late Early Bronze Age to Early late Bronze Age um, and I'm very much following the two articles I've done the the first one um, being about Egypt and can the Orthodox chronology be shortened enough to match an old kingdom exodus so the Orthodox chronology tends to put the exodus in the time of Ramesses II or his son Manetta and the conquest at the end of the Late Bronze Age, or for those who follow a more biblical chronology, they, they put the Exodus at about 1450 BC, which on the Orthodox chronology is about the time of the III or his son Amenhotep II, um, which I don't think fits very well. Now, SIS people have tended to put the conquest in the Middle Bronze Age and the Exodus in the 13th dynasty. Uh, so Velikovsky followed to some extent by James, Roll, Bimpson and I think Peter van der Veen. Um, but as I said, I'm trying to put it at the end of the Old Kingdom. Um, right, so just a quick revision of Egyptian history. Um, in the Old Kingdom, we get the Great Pyramids. In the Middle Kingdom, we get some second-rate brick pyramids crumbling away. In the New Kingdom, we get the great conquering pharaohs. This is showing Tutmose III smiting his enemies. And I'm finishing partway through the New Kingdom at the Amarna period. This is one of the clay <coughs> tablets written in cuneiform uh, part of the Amarna letters by which pharaohs Amenhotep III and Akhenaten communicated with their vassals in Canaan and other empires further away. Um, now, after each kingdom, you get an intermediate period. So the first intermediate period, the second intermediate period, and the third intermediate period. So the last one doesn't concern us today. Now, uh, just reviewing biblical history, so the biblical dates seem to come out roughly as follows. The slavery in Egypt ends at 1450 BC, the conquest about 40 years later. Then a long judges period, and then the beginnings of the monarchy, uh, Saul and David. Um, now, the Judges period it is actually a very long period, about 380 years. And here's a list of uh, the judges, uh, starting with Joshua and ending with Samuel, who anointed uh, Saul and David as kings. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more later about Deborah and Abimelech, uh, who give nice archaeological tie-ins with my chronology. Um, just uh, saying a bit more about the uh, length of this period. I'm not expecting you to read this, but what we've got here is a list of judges and the oppressions of the Israelites 
and this is the what the, the period that the Bible gives to the judges and to Joshua and just after. And these are the periods of the various oppressions. So, for example, there's a Canaanite oppression which lasts for 20 years and is ended by Deborah and uh, General Barak, uh, who then rules for 40 years. But uh, these columns actually add up to about 380 years, and you've got another century here. So it's generally assumed, perhaps correctly, that the oppression periods are part of the 40 years allocated to Deborah. So the 20 years Canaanite oppression is included within the 40 years. Now, um, Egyptian chronology, I, I, the orthodox chronology, I'm using this book, Ancient Egyptian Chronology, uh, published in 2006. So it's a fairly up-to-date one, and it's before radiocarbon dating started to uh, mess things up or change things not to my liking. Um, in 2010, there was a big radiocarbon dating study which made things some decades older or perhaps as much as a century older in the Old Kingdom. And also since then, there's been uh, some very surprising results from uh, Canaan, which seemed to be pushing the early Bronze Age uh, about four centuries earlier. Anyway, it remains to be seen how that's going to work out. So I'm, I'm ignoring radiocarbon dating for the purposes of this talk. Um, now, uh, coming back to Egyptian history, so the Old Kingdom ends about 2150 BC according to the ancient Egyptian chronology book. Um, 2200 is a more common figure. And then you've got the first intermediate, the Middle Kingdom, second intermediate period, and the first part of the New Kingdom. Um, oops. Uh, and those are all periods of, in the region of 200 years. Now, shoving that to one side so I can put biblical chronology on the other side. Um, now, you can see at the top there, I'm trying to lose about 700 years. Um, to equate the Bible and the old end of the Old Kingdom, the Exodus with the end of the Old Kingdom. Um, as you'll see, I can't quite do that, but never mind. Uh, now, I don't have to get rid of the whole 700 years because at the bottom line, I'm following David Roll's new chronology, um, which brings the Amarna period down to the time of David, uh, saving about 350 years. Um, for those of you who don't follow David Roll's new chronology, the shortenings I'm going to propose in this period um, may still apply. Um, and for this earlier period, I'm certainly not following David Roll, I'm completely contradicting him. But I do agree with him for the period after the bottom of this table. Um, Notice also that the long judges period uh, covers sort of most of the first intermediate, middle kingdom, second intermediate, and early new kingdom on, on my chronology. Um, so, as I said, these talks are based on the two articles I've recently done in review. Um, so, for the first intermediate period, I argued that the 165 years in the ancient Egyptian chronology book can be reduced to 100, saving 65 years. Uh, for the details, you'll have to look in my articles. Um, and for the Middle Kingdom, I'm not uh, trying to save any time. It seems to be fairly well documented, the reign lengths and the uh, sequence of pharaohs. But there may be a few decades to be saved there. <coughs> the big saving, I think, comes in the second intermediate period, dynasties 13 to 17. So instead of uh, 220 years, 
I'm suggesting this can be reduced to 50 years, saving 170 years. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm nicking somebody else's ideas. This is uh, a French Egyptologist, Raymond Vey. Um, and I'm nicking Roll's ideas for the later periods and uh, Corville's idea for something else I'll come to. Um, now, just to say a little bit more about the second intermediate period, um, again, I'm not expecting you to read this. Um, this, this is a chronological tab table from the Cambridge Ancient History. It, it's convenient because it's got the whole period of the second intermediate period on the um, on one double page spread and th this period uh, supposedly 220 years is absolutely filled with numerous kings so this is the 13th dynasty and these this is just a selection of the um, of the kings now some of these kings are, are real people uh, or significant people Neferhotep the first reigns 11 years and we've got statues of him and other bits and pieces and his brother followed by his brother Sebek Hotep the fourth eight plus years um, and the character Kenja here four plus years he actually has a small pyramid so some of them were definitely significant people um, possibly reigning all of Egypt um, but for the 14th dynasty um, it says 70, 76 kings of Xois, wherever that was of which there is probably one king that we know something about and that he was ruling some part of Egypt at some point in time the, the 15th dynasty, the Hyksos, there's two of those who seem to be significant rulers, Kyan and Apophis. Uh, the 16th dynasty we don't know much about, and the 17th dynasty they've split into two groups. The second group were the ancestors of the 18th dynasty, and yes, they did exist and were ruling in Thebes. Um, the first group, some of them we've got their tombs in Thebes, so yes, they seem to have been ruling in Thebes. Um, rather short lengths of reign though, um, according to the Turin canon, like three years, X months, 16 years, one year, one year. Um, again, it's a bit puzzling quite what all these people were reigning over, what they were doing. Um, and now this chap I mentioned, Raymond Vey, uh, Frenchman, so he's not whale or while or wheel, but Vey. Um, he, in his younger days, wrote a two volume book on the second intermediate period um, with the orthodox length of over 200 years. But towards the end of his life, he came to the conclusion that the second intermediate period actually only lasted a few decades um, and he was not only a leading Egyptologist or possibly the leading Egyptologist by 1950 uh, in France um, he had excavated in Canaan as well in Jerusalem he, he wrote a book late in his life, which was published after his death, um, called Douzeum Dynasty Royalty Adult Egypt et Ixos dans le Nord, which in English is 12th Dynasty Royalty of Upper Egypt and Hyksos in the North. And the significance of the title is that the three groups, he, he says, were largely reigning at the same time. Um, so the, the Hyksos in the north is particularly Dynasty 15 with Kyan and Apophis. Um, the royalty of Upper Egypt is some of these numerous 13th and 17th Dynasty kings. And he has most of them overlapping with the end of the 12th Dynasty, the Middle Kingdom. Now, 
there's a surprising part confirmation, I think, of Vey's ideas um, in recently published in the journal Egyptian and the Levant um, in 2011. Um, this journal was started by Professor Bietak in Vienna, hence the German title of the same meaning. Um, and in this issue, there was an article, oops, <laughs> discussion of late Middle Kingdom and early Second Intermediate Period history and chronology in relation to the Kayan ceilings from Tel Edfu by Nadine Merler and Gregory Marawa. Um, Tel Edfu is a site that's been excavated in southern Egypt. Um, Kayan, I've mentioned, as a pharaoh of the Hyksos 15th dynasty, ruling in northern Egypt. And uh, ceilings refers to clay ceilings on um, either papyrus rolls or containers of uh, various goods. And these were found in this building in Tel Edfu, which is a, a Middle Kingdom columned hall. Uh, so we've got a wall here, a wall here. You can see the places where the columns used to be. Um, and another columned hall down here. Um, the, the green is an excavated surface, the last surface um, during which the hall was used for administrative purposes. It subsequently became uh, a collection of silos for grain storage, so you, which is hence the circular shapes. Um, now, on the floor of, of this last use as an administrative building, there were lots of ceilings, amongst other things, and pottery. Uh, apparently, many of them swept into a corner. Now, these ceilings uh, include uh, ceilings with the cartouche of Cayenne and ceilings with the cartouche of Sebekhotep IV. Um, so six ceilings from Sebekhotep and 40 ceilings from Cayenne, all in use apparently at the same time. Now, on the orthodox chronology, these two pharaohs were a century apart. Now, you might argue that um, somebody was using an old seal of Sebekhotep IV. But it's not just the royal ceilings. There were official ceilings as well. Um, in fact, 82 of that particular one um, from both periods, apparently, and pottery from both periods, all mixed together. So, hence it seems that Kayan and Sebekhotep IV were contemporaries, uh, losing a hundred years out of the Second Intermediate Period. And uh, the authors wrote, the presence of Kayan, of Dynasty 15, in the same context together with the other ceilings of the late Middle Kingdom tradition, i.e. Dynasty 13, especially Sebekhotep IV, and those of the Palestinian series combined with ceramic evidence and a 14C date is very strong evidence for a chronological overlap of the late 13th and early 15th dynasties. This discovery has certainly consequences for the overall length of the Second Intermediate Period. Um, so for the New Kingdom, the first part of the New Kingdom, I'm not proposing to make any saving Although uh, an article did come out just recently, uh, saving at least five years, I think. So there might be a bit more to be had there. So summing up uh, the total savings, uh, the lengths which I'm proposing for the first intermediate, the Middle Kingdom, second intermediate, part of New King, 540 years. And if Amarna is the same time as Saul and David at about 1000 BC following 
following Roll's new chronology, then we get an exodus at 1540 BC. So not the apparent biblical 1450 BC, um, but uh, 90 years earlier. So I'm getting there, or perhaps the biblical date can be stretched a bit. So now the next part um, follows somewhat my second article. Um, now by Canaan or the Levant, I mean this sort of area, so Israel, Lebanon, western parts of Syria and western parts of Jordan, that's generally referred to as the Levant. And now, now here we get uh, an archaeological sequence, early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, Iron Age. Um, these, the metal terminology bronze and iron is really rather out of date now. Um, it's effectively pot a pottery sequence and you find that the various ages are divided up into early bronze 1, 2, 3, middle bronze 1, 2A, 2BC, etc, etc. Now, examples of the pottery idea of, of sequences, um, this shows some representative types. Now, because it's an archaeological diagram, time runs from the bottom up. So early Bronze Age layers will tend to be below Middle Bronze Age and below the Greek and Persian, etc. And just to pick out a few odd examples, in, in the early Bronze Age you get storage jars with flat bottoms. Uh, obviously beneficial, it helps them to stand up. In, in the Middle Bronze Age they tend to have rounded bottoms. Um, so you have to put them in a corner of a room, otherwise they fall over. Um, the, the Middle Bronze Age pottery, however, is, is very well made um, on a fast wheel, highly fired, and it's good quality stuff. In the Late Bronze Age, it's not quite so good quality, but you often get painted decoration. Um, you also get a lot of foreign imports, so a Cypriot milk bowl, so-called, because the basic colour is white. Um, a bichrome uh, vessel, uh, another import from Cyprus with red and black paints, um, and I think that's a Mycenaean pyxis uh, from the Greek side of things, and so on through the Iron Age, Persian Hellenistic. Um, now, coming back to the Early Bronze Age and the Middle Bronze Age, um, Early Bronze IV and MB1 are in fact the same period. Um, it's, it's a strange period, it's had many different names. The Intermediate Bronze Age, EB4, MB1, EBMB, or as I used in my article, EB4 stroke MB1. Um, so EB4 and MB1 aren't really there, they are this period which I'm suggesting is the Israelite arrival. Some people call it EB4 because the pottery is somewhat similar to the early bronze pottery. Um, others preferred MB1 because the culture is completely different. Now, sorting out the uh, table a bit, um, both the early bronze age and the middle bronze age were periods of fortified towns but the EB4, MB1 period, it's more like villages and nomads. So I'm suggesting this was the arrival of the Israelites. So I said I pinched other people's ideas. This, this idea was originally Donovan Corville's idea, published in his book in 1971, The Exodus Problem and Its Ramifications. The rest of his chronology I thought was sort of wrong, but I liked the idea of the Old Kingdom Exodus and End of Early Bronze Age Conquest. So I end up with this chart, which you've got on your handout, um, which I'll break down a bit, taking out the middle. Now the top two lines are a fairly 
orthodox biblical chronology. Moses and Joshua about 1500 BC, down to Saul and David at 1000 BC. Um, I've put in the two judges I mentioned, Deborah and Abimelech, and also the last judge, Samuel. Um, the, the bottom line shows the Egyptian sequence. Um, Dynasty VI, end of Old Kingdom. The first intermediate period, um, the little, little space there, plus half of Dynasty XI. The Middle Kingdom, half of Dynasty XI plus Dynasty XII. And then the second intermediate period, which is normally given over 200 years, um, but you can see on the top scale, I've, I've reduced it to about 50 years, following Raymond Vey. Um, then we get the beginning of the New Kingdom, Dynasty 18, Tutmos III, Akhenaten in the Amarna periods, um, following Dave Roll, that reduces to 1,000. Now, just looking at the middle band, I, I largely accept the, the archaeological sequence but there are some periods, I think, like the Middle Bronze 2A, which are not so much a chron chronological uh, division, but a geographical one. I, I think the MB2A was a largely coastal type of pottery and greatly overlapped the EBMB and the MB2B. Um, similarly with the Late Bronze 1 period, uh, big overlap with Middle Bronze 2C and possibly overlapping Late Bronze 2A. The, the sloping lines are supposed to indicate gradual transitions between these various periods. Um, now moving on to some archaeological examples of how things fit. This, this is Jericho in the early 1990s looking south down the Jordan Valley, the River Jordan over to the left, the hills of <coughs> Israel or the West Bank on the right. Um, and also over to the right is Kenyon's Trench 1. Um, I should say there's been uh, four excavations of Jericho, the first by the Germans before the First World War, the second between the wars by an English expedition under John Garstang. Then after the Second World War, Kathleen Kenyon's excavations in the 1950s and recently a joint Italian-Palestinian excavation. Yes, so uh, Kenyon's Trench 1 over on the right, um, this, this great trench here. Down the bottom are Neolithic levels and at this sort of level is early Bronze Age levels. The uh, top eroded or excavated away and um, the little blue notice from the Antiquities Authority says City Wall uh, circa 2000 BC uh, or maybe 2200 would perhaps be a more common date. And you, you may be able to see sort of here bits of reddish burnt brickwork. Th this in fact is a whole conglomeration of walls that were re rebuilt, reinforced during the early Bronze Age. Um, and indeed there is another set of early Bronze Age walls over here somewhere. I can't say exactly where. And um, turning to one of Garstang's drawings, uh, you can see this double wall system running around part of the tell. Um, but he says they're late Bronze Age walls, not early Bronze Age. Kenyon's Trench 1 was about here somewhere. Um, just going back to Kenyon's Trench, moving to the south side of the trench standing by the little blue notice board in Hebrew and English. Um, you can see the continuation of the early bronze walls, wall conglomeration here, a bit of brickworks showing there. 
and the outer early Bronze Age wall is that one there and sloping lines of debris uh, from the early Bronze Age period and Kenyans people actually drew that edge side of the trench um, and all the different strata in it um, Neolithic down here uh, early Bronze Age here so there's one wall con conglomeration and there's the other wall conglomeration and middle bronze layers up here and Kenyon wrote Kenyon and Garstang were both partly right and partly wrong in my opinion Professor Garstang in his 1930-36 to 36 excavations uncovered the remains of a stage in the town wall that had collapsed with against it the evidence of a terrific conflagration. This certainly fits the description of the fate of Jericho given in Joshua 6. Unfortunately, Garstang was misled. The wall in question belongs to the early Bronze Age, circa 2300 BC. So Garstang was right about the wall being that destroyed by Joshua, but wrong that it was late Bronze Age. Kenyon was right that the walls were early Bronze Age, but wrong in denying that they were Joshua's. Now, moving on to Deborah and the site of Hatsor. Uh, this has been excavated by the Israelis since, I think, the 1950s. Um, this is an aerial view in the early days. They'd already started excavating on the upper tell. Um, there's a main road runs past the foot of the tell. But in the Middle Bronze Age, the city was greatly expanded by earthen ramparts enclosing a large lower tell. And various bits of the lower town have now been excavated as well. Now, in the Bible, the Canaanites under King Jabin were oppressing the Israelites. Um, and there seems to be confirmation of this King Jabin in a fragmentary clay tablet that was found at Hatzor. Um, the top line, what's left of it, apparently addresses the letter to Ibni. Um, it's assumed that this would have been a king and the message is something about a woman or perhaps more than one. Um, but Ibni is the equivalent of biblical Jabin. This seems to be generally acknowledged. Uh, you've got the consonants there and his full name is thought to have been Ibn Adu. The reason they put the second half of the name on is because Hatzor was trading with Mari on the Euphrates and several clay tablets there mention uh, King Ibn Adu of Hatzor. So that seems a uh, a possible uh, or likely confirmation that there was a King Jabin uh, in the Middle Bronze Age at Hatzor. Now, also relating to Hatzor, this is a so-called execration text found in Egypt. Um, the idea was that uh, Hatzor might be a threat to Egypt, so you write curses on this figurine against Hatzor and its king and then you smash the figurine and Hatzor's power against you is destroyed. Now these figurines date on the Orthodox chronology to Middle Bronze 2a but Hatzor wasn't built until Middle Bronze 2b. It, it had existed in the early Bronze Age so the, the Orthodox people come up with the explanation that uh, these curses were composed in the early Bronze Age period and the Middle Kingdom people, I should say, uh, just copied them, not realising that Hatzor didn't exist at that time. 
However, as I explained, um, I think the MB2A overlaps with the MB2B. So that sort did exist then. Um, so that fits nicely with the shorter chronology. Moving on to Shechem and the story of Abimelech. Um, Shechem again has had a German excavation about the time of the First World War. And in the uh, 60s it was excavated by the Americans. This is their plan of the old town, um, the uh, outer wall. Um, they found a, a gateway here and these buildings which uh, the Austro-German expedition thought were a palace and this enormous temple which as I'll explain uh, seems to fit in with the Abimelech's story in Judges chapter 9. Down here we've uh, got an Arab village and orchards and um, these are in indicating various excavation areas. Um, there was also an east gate here. Um, so an artist reconstruction of this big temple. Um, all that's been excavated, of course, is the foundations, but it may have looked something like this. It, it was a very big building, very strong building. And in Judges chapter 9, Abimelech was the son or a son of Gideon by a concubine who lived in Shechem. And when Gideon died, Abimelech persuaded the Shechemites to back him as king. He then went and murdered Gideon's other sons and he ruled Israel, or at least part of it, for three years. After three years, he fell out with the people of Shechem. And this is the story uh, that then follows where he attacks Shechem. So he took his men, divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. When he saw the people coming out of the city, he rose to attack them. Abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance of the city gate. Then two companies attacked those in the fields and struck them down. All that day Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he'd captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. Now I, I think I may be trying to interpret the text here but um, we, we backtrack slightly at this point to part way through his attack on the city and, and this is where the um, temple comes in. The people re uh, retreated into that and it's called the uh, Temple of El Bereth or Baal Bereth, which means Lord of the Covenant. So it, it seems it was some sort of Yahweh worship um, referring to the covenant between the Israelites and Yahweh in the time of Joshua. Uh, so carrying on here. Um, on hearing this, i.e. Abimelech's attack in the fields, the citizens of the tower, or perhaps citadel of Shechem, that northwest corner, went into the stronghold of the temple of El Bereth. When Abimelech heard that they'd assembled here, he took an axe and cut off some branches which he lifted onto his shoulders. He ordered the men with him, quick, do what you've seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them against the stronghold, i.e. the stronghold of El, the temple of El Bereth, and set it on fire with the people still inside. So just going back to the, that northwest corner, here's the big temple, um, the stronghold of El Bereth. Um, now this, on my chronology, this fits nicely because it's Middle Bronze Age, the time I'm suggesting the Judges period should be. Now, in the Orthodox chronology, the Judges period was in Iron Age I, much later. Now, 
This is some sort of aerial view of the temple, the stone foundations of the temple. And the American excavators um, at first thought this must surely be the temple of Abimelech's time. And uh, their first article said that. Um, also, the earlier Austro-German ex ex expedition had said much the same thing. But both expeditions later realised that this temple was of the Middle Bronze Age too. Um, and uh, so the American excavator, uh, G.E. Wright, um, looked for a later temple to match the Iron Age Joshua that he was expecting. Um, so he invented Temple 2 out of these two little bits of wall. Um, but, uh, oops, <laughs> those bits of wall are in fact underneath an Iron Age 2 building much later and were possibly the foundations, part of the foundations for that later building. And recently scholars have come to reject Wright's Temple 2 and, and they try to suggest now that the original temple lasted right through the Late Bronze Age and into Iron Age 1 for Abimelech to attack it. Well, it may be possible, but the Abimelech story fits much better into the Middle Bronze Age 2 period. I rather like Donovan Corville's comment G. E. Wright was right in his earlier writing. Now I'll just quickly do one more example of how my chronology seems to be superior. Uh, at Byblos there were found royal tombs, Byblos on the, in the coast of modern Le Lebanon. <coughs> um, tomb 2 of Yapi Shemu Abi, if I've pronounced that right, son of Abi Shemu, um, we think it's his tomb because found inside it was uh, a sort of uh, sickle sword, not actually that one, but the, w the one uh, of his um, has this sort of gold embossed strip down both sides which say Yapi Shemu Abi, son of Abi Shemu. Now also in these two tombs were these royal gifts from 12th dynasty pharaohs, um, Amenemhet III, found in tomb one, a sort of gold plated vase with his cartouches there and there. And in tomb two was a gift, this casket, gold bits on it, uh, from Amenemhet IV, the son of Amenemhet III. So coming back to this, we've got inscribed gifts from Amenemhet III and Amenemhet IV. Um, and as their father and son, we've probably got a father and son sequence here, uh, which would make Abi Shemu the owner of this two. And it was suggested that the connecting passage was so that the father and son could communicate in the afterlife. That may or may not be true. But it, it seems a fairly good tie-up between the 12th dynasty pharaohs and these princes of Byblos. Ah, no, says the latest thinking by a pottery expert from the Tel El Darba team. Um, this is some of the pottery found in tombs two and three, actually, from uh, the French excavations uh, between the wars, 1920s, I think. And you can see uh, storage jars, uh, little jugglets, plates and cups. Now, this, this compares at Tel El Darba to uh, a much later period. Now, you don't have to read this. This is one of Manfred Bitak's stratigraphic charts from Tel El Darba, time running upwards. And he, he gives various uh, areas that have been excavated at Tel El Darba. 
against the chronology of Egypt, 12th dynasty, Middle Kingdom, second intermediate period, dynasties 13 and 15, and beginning of the New Kingdom, and the archaeological sequence on the left there. Um, now, I'm going to uh, enlarge this part and bring over part of the general stratigraphy classification at Tel Darba. So here we are again, the, the Egyptian dynasties with Amenemhet III and Amenemhet IV there in MB2A or MB1 as it's often called. Uh, the uh, second intermediate period. Now, Karen Kopetsky, this uh, pottery expert, she has compared the Byblos Royal Tombs pottery to strata E2 and E3 at Tel Darba. So not down here, up, up here. But uh, remember that I'm proposing following Raymond Vey to shorten this period. So these pharaohs will move up to about here, about the time of strata E2 and E3. And MB2A and MB2B overlap, much more than is shown in that short transition period there. So again, it, uh, it fits uh, my cr proposed chronology. Um, that's it. So uh, we've got, I think, uh, well, at least five minutes for questions. Thank you all. Um, now, if there's any questions, we have a little time left. Yes. I'd just like to make a statement that uh, carbon dating is not constant. It changes with the amount of charge and at any given time. Just like all the constants in nature, they are not constant at all, whether it's an act gravity or indeed carbon dating. It changes it's with? The amount of charge around the atmosphere, electrical okay. charge. Yes. It's one of the things we deal with in the electric universe, and I can certainly give you a link on YouTube to show you this, which might help you with your dating. Okay. Certainly another aspect is that carbon dates have to be calibrated by dendrochronology, tree ring dating. Yeah, well that can't that it's not stable either because uh, trees will change depending on the amount of water. Well, uh, well what I was going to say was this dendrochronology sequence is, has never been properly published. No, it's and so we it don't can't, know. It can't be regarded, regarded as that either. So it depends on the environmental conditions. If there's a lot well, it's, of it's not as simple as that. I mean, they typically use oak trees, which are very regular in producing one ring per year. No, no, it's best to use single species and then you don't get so much variation. Uh, at one time they used bristle cones pines, which could produce more than one ring per year. Um, but nowadays they prefer to use oak trees. Um, I, I do find radiocarbon uh, dating a difficulty, but I'll have a look at your yeah, proposal. Yeah, 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 okay, well, okay well, we're a minute Thank early. Thank you very yeah. much for okay. a very yeah. interesting lecture. What you were prompted, as okay. you yes. see, quite a bit of discussion. Yeah. Uh, uh, so thank you for uh, entertaining okay. us for yep. our last yep. okay. uh, hour. Okay. <laughs>